This video is sponsored by Skillshare. It's hard to believe it has been five months since we started this project and there's been a lot that has changed about the 1940s bungalow. We've removed tons of plaster walls. We've removed a whole wall between the kitchen and the living room. We took out a chimney. We've reframed a bunch of stuff, put in a pocket door, pulled up floors. And this week, this week is the week that I have been waiting for for a long time. So excited about it because this is the week that we're closing in the walls. I have a drywaller who's showing up on Saturday. Today is Monday and we have a ton left to do to prep for that. We have to frame two walls. We have to frame archways. We have to insulate the entire house, redo some flooring. We have to do the cove, which I'm really excited about. But first, there's something that I need to do that I have been putting off for a while because I don't wanna mess it up. I've been nervous to make this cut because I'm gonna have to cut into the original hardwood floors, a feature of this house that up until this point, I've been trying to save. When Luis and I removed the wall between the kitchen and the living room, the floor was left with a ragged edge that used to sit underneath the trim. Now we could try and repair that, but I actually decided that it'd be easier and better to push it back 10 inches. Because if you look at the design for the kitchen, you'll see I'm adding a bar top to the peninsula. That gives me the freedom to let the kitchen floor kind of invade the living room. I'll save you watching Luis and I try and measure this about 40 times before actually committing to it. But I feel like in the end, we got it in the right spot and we should be good. With the wood flooring cut to the right spot, I can add the rest of the cement board. And we started laying this out before. We wanted to add cement board because we're gonna be doing tile on top of it. It's a nice substrate between the wooden subfloor and the tile. It makes it easier to glue it down to. It's also gonna have the added benefit of raising the floor up so we don't need a transition between the tile and the wood floor. Luis and I pre-cut, labeled, and then removed the panels because we're gonna put thin set underneath it. Thin set is a mortar mix that binds the panels to the subfloor, and it's also gonna be able to bind the tiles to the panels. Now it has a limited working time, so we wanted to make sure and have as much prepped as possible before mixing up a batch. So why did I think this was a priority before putting in drywall and insulation? Mostly it came down to just how dusty those processes are. We've had to vacuum and clean this floor several times. There's a lot of gaps in the old floorboards and this will just make it a more uniform surface. It's a process that we have to do at some point and it just felt like it was the right time to do it now. Once again, it's so nice to have an extra set of hands on these jobs. Luis went behind with each panel and screwed them in while I mixed a more thin set and laid that out. Together, we were able to get this whole floor done within just a couple hours. B4. Four what? <laughs> so I'm, clever. I'm a, I'm a dad now, Michael. I can make those kind of jokes. <laughs> may sound a little cheesy, but I kind of got sentimental about removing this dry erase board. I've been using it to track everything, and now we've moved so far along that I need access to this wall so we can put insulation in it. So we are ready to insulate the house, which is really exciting. We've got the heater on, so once we're insulated, it'll be nice and warm in here throughout the winter. We decided to go with rock wool insulation instead of fiberglass bats for a couple different reasons. I like this product a lot, not a sponsor, but I do appreciate that it helps cut down on noise. We have a 
pretty busy street out front and it'll cut down on a bunch of that noise. It's also moisture resistant, which fiberglass is not. Old house like this is probably gonna leak a little bit here and there. And the problem with the fiberglass is that it'll compress when it gets wet and it won't bounce back. This stuff won't do that. It's also incredibly fire resistant. So uh, this stuff is made out of rocks. So it does not burn in any situation. It's great stuff. It's a little bit more expensive, but for a house this small, the extra expense really wasn't that much to worry about. And I think we're gonna have a better product in the end. Before I can add any insulation bats, I wanna make sure and fill in all the holes that we made from running the new electrical, the new plumbing, removing the old plumbing. And for that, I used some self-expanding spray foam to fill it all in, and then we can start laying out the bats. How many of these we can get in without doing anything to yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And then we'll stitch in around that. We started the installation by putting in as many bats as we could without making cuts. So wherever we could put full bats in, we did. Then when we did have to make cuts, the manufacturer recommends actually using a bread knife to cut this stuff. And I have to say it works pretty darn well. After doing this whole install, I noticed a lot of advantages to using rock wool. For one, it's not nearly as itchy as the pink stuff. It also presses into place and holds itself in the bays, so you don't need to use anything mechanical to hold them in. If you've ever worked with fiberglass insulation, you'll know that it's not this easy. It's crazy to think that it's been almost eight years since I started creating videos for you guys. Back then, I was a bit of a mess. I didn't know the first thing about editing, SLR cameras, or lighting. What helped me get my act together was that in the first year that I started this channel, I signed up for Skillshare. I'm excited to have them sponsoring this video. In a weird way, it feels like everything's just Coming full circle, the classes that I took from Skillshare have paid off in so many ways. Not only did they have all the cinematography stuff that I needed, I've taken classes in art and design, running a small business, and even website management. It's been the secondary education that I didn't realize that I needed. So we're almost in the new year and we all have things that we want to learn and do in 2024. And trust me, Skillshare can help you accomplish your goals. Skillshare classes are led by industry pros who have walked the walk and an active community of members ready to cheer you on. Whether you want to use AI tools to increase your productivity, build a subscriber base for your email newsletter, or open your first Etsy shop, Skillshare can help you get there. And the best part is that you can try Skillshare for free and see if you like it. The first 500 people to use my link in the description will get a one month free trial. I started with a free trial and it was legitimately one of the best things that I've ever done. I'll also put a list of the classes that helped me the most. So check out the link in my description and start your free trial today. Now let's get back to the house because there's a lot left to do. So I've been holding off on building one more wall in this house and I've just been waiting on the floor, but now that the floor has been cut and I know where it ends, I can start building this wall. The purpose of this wall is to cover up the fridge, which is gonna sit right in here. It's also gonna extend this way into the living room, which is gonna allow me to have a countertop that you can put stools at. Um, I'm extending the wall all the way up to catch the cove at the top. And so it's just gonna complete a bunch of odds and ends right in this corner. Now, I don't wanna use like a full two by four depth on this wall because that's more than we need and every square inch counts in this kitchen. So I'm actually gonna turn it on its side and frame it up this way in the inch and a half direction just to save us a little space. So obviously this wall doesn't need to be structural. It's not structural at all, but I did want to make sure that it has plenty of nailing surface for both the drywall and to connect it to the existing wall. So the placement of the studs was pretty important. The 
building code requires that you have an outlet installed for any permanently affixed island or peninsula. So I had my electrician run a wire down the fridge wall and I installed an outlet at the same height as the rest of the countertops. With the outlet in the right location, now it's time to see if the wall fits. With a bit of persuasion, I was able to get the wall in. Now I have to check it for square. I put in one nail and then used a framer square to square up the other end and nailed that off. The top corner of the wall also needs to be tied in, so I added in a 2x4 between the joists that I can nail to. The wall wasn't a tight fit, so I added in a shim, and then used a level to make sure it was plumb. Another project that I've been putting off for a little while is this closet. So this is the old linen closet. If you remember from the first video, I had the idea of subdividing it into two different spaces. So we keep a linen closet on the other side, but since it's so deep, we can actually gain a built-in on the living room side, which is gonna be handy to put books and other odds and ends that we want to store or display. Now all these closets are cedar lined, which is awesome. And I'm keeping that in most of the closets, but since I need to access the framing, I took out the cedar and added in a new stud to support the new wall. This wall is gonna be framed out the same as the wall that I just put in in the kitchen, except for a couple key differences. I want it to be a little bit shorter than the full height because I can actually gain a little bit of space on the linen closet side. I'm also gonna tip up the top two by four, and this is gonna give me some nailing surface to pick up the archway detail I'm gonna to add to this built-in. Now you can see how this framing is coming together and how I've been able to add an upper shelf to the linen closet. This is just gonna allow for a little bit of deep storage inside of it. Back at the workshop, this is the exciting part. I've been looking forward to building these arches for a while. I did a little bit of research on what the, the drywaller is gonna need to get consistent arches, and this is the plan that I came up with. I'm adding two arches to the house. One is gonna go in the built-in, and that's the smaller of the two, and the bigger of the two is gonna go into the hallway entry door, which I feel like having that design repeated throughout the house is gonna look really cool. Both arches are gonna be perfect circles, so I can just nail one nail into the corner of each square and use a string line to make an arc. By removing the nail and putting it back in in the opposite corner, I can actually get two arcs out of each square. Once I have all my lines drawn out, I can cut it on the bandsaw. I cut this a little bit away from the line so I have room to sand it back.
So if I were to sand each of the eight pieces individually at the bench top sander, they're not gonna end up matching no matter how hard I try. So what I do is I sand one of them as perfect as I can get it, and I use that as a template for the rest of them. I double stick tape one of the rough cut ones to the template, then I can use a template cutting bit on my router to trim it up. Using this method ensures that each one of these panels ends up identical. Now this is where the two archways become pretty different because one of them is a lot deeper than the other. The one that's going in the built-in is gonna be about 12 inches deep and the one that goes over the doorway is only gonna be about an inch and a half deep. So I cut down the scrap plywood that I had into thin strips that I can use to space out the two archways. I'm starting with the smaller of the two. This is the one that goes into the built-in and I just nailed in from the side all of these strips to get the spacing right. These strips will not only space it out, but they are also gonna act as nailers so I can attach it to the framing around the built-in. On the curved side of the archway, I also need nailers. This is for the drywaller to attach the drywall to. I'll be honest, I'm kind of making up this spacing. I'm not quite sure how he's gonna attach the drywall, so hopefully this works out. With the built-in arches made, I can slide it into the framing that I did before. I use those back nailers to attach it to the 2x4s that I installed on both the wall and the ceiling. On the right-hand side, you may have noticed I cut out a little notch for the cleat that I made to support the top rail, and that worked out great. Back in the shop, I can start assembling the larger of the two archways, and you can see I'm using the same scrap pieces of plywood I was before, actually just the off-cut ends, and I just turned them on their side so they weren't quite as deep. For the archway side, I cut a bunch of these small pieces and glued them in and nailed them. Now, I wanted to make sure that I had plenty of these because it is a pretty long arch, but I also wanted to make sure that I didn't cover up the nailers in the back because I got to be able to reach those so that I can attach it to the framing. I gotta say that these things came out looking so cool. I, I had some doubts about doing the arches, but once I started seeing them come together, I'm really, really happy. I can't wait to see these covered in drywall. If you've been following this whole series, you'll know that I have a coved ceiling in the living room that I've been trying to protect. It's part of the original house and uh, I need to figure out a way to dead end that. So we took out the wall and in doing that, we cut out a whole chunk of cove. So now we need to either end it here where you can see that little loose end is or wrap it around the inside of the breakfast nook because I thought it would look kind of nice to do that. But I <laughs> I've never installed a cove before. With a little bit of research, I found a company that makes cove kits. And although I can make the, the basic forms like these, the more complex forms that go into the corners are a bit more difficult. So uh, I'm gonna just follow the instructions from the cove kit. But first I've gotta wrap the whole room in a two by four so it's spaced out the same distance as it is in the living room. With just a day remaining before the drywaller shows up, there's a lot to do. And having not built this kit before, I was not sure I could pull it off. Starting from the existing framing, I wrapped the two by fours around the breakfast nook following a line from my laser. Some of the walls weren't perfectly flat, so I used shims to space them out. The original coving was made by attaching a 2x4 to the wall and then stretching some expanded metal between the ceiling and that 2x4. They then pressed in the plaster and that held the form. We're going to do it a little different for this section. The way this company works is they create forms exactly for your space given some really basic drawings and they matched up the exact size of the original coving and created these plywood ribs that were going to run around the whole perimeter. 
Some of these ribs are easy to attach to existing structure in the ceiling. However, a majority of them need some sort of nailer. And so I cut some scrap two by fours in the same way that I did for the kitchen wall and added them in wherever necessary. Back when we were trying to come up with creative solutions for what to do with the cove, uh, Luis and I were talking and I, I said my pie in the sky dream was to have the cove wrap through the kitchen. And I honestly didn't think that it was gonna be possible, but it turns out it really was not that difficult, especially with this kit, it made it super easy. And now I, I can see this kitchen taking shape and it's so freaking cool, I can't believe it. time to clean and it's so wild to see this like without tools and all put together and it's ready for drywall it's literally ready for drywall the drywaller is showing up i'm so excited to see what this looks like all closed in There's something we said about being a specialist in a field. These guys were experts and they were fast and just really impressive how they worked as a team and how they knocked out this house inside of a day. There are 47 sheets of drywall that are going into this house. I'm very glad that I'm not the one doing it. One thing that stuck out to me is how much they use routers to trim out the drywall. In this case, he was using it to trim out around a, a window frame, and I was impressed that he did it completely freehand just following a line that he had drawn. The other thing that they would do is lay the sheet on, screw it down, and then trim out for vents or outlets, and also trim out the edges of wall. One thing that I was really curious how they were gonna pull off was the curves inside of the arches. And for that, they used a technique that I know full well as a woodworker of kerf cutting. So they cut a bunch of kerfs in the backside of a quarter inch sheet of drywall and then carefully moved that into place and that conformed to the curves. This technique does leave flat spots in the drywall, but once we add mud and sand back that mud, it'll be nice and round. When it came to drywalling the coves, they used a very similar kerf cutting technique where he cut along long strips and it seemed to work really well. He was able to get it into this pretty tight bend, which I personally was worried about, but he wasn't. Impressively, it took the crew only a day to drywall the entire house. A couple days later, the tapers arrived and they were ready to cover all the new drywall with mud and tape. And they also are fixing all the old plaster work as well. When it came to covering those archways, they started right away trimming some flexible edging to wrap around each curve.
The way they attached the edging was really interesting. They used this product I'd never seen before. It's 3M61 spray adhesive, and it gives enough tack that they can hold it into place, but it also allows them to make adjustments so that they can refine the curve. <laughs> Once refined, they put on another coat of the spray adhesive and let it dry. The living room ceiling was covered in cracks and fortunately they were willing to repair these. I think there were some cracks existing, but a lot of them have been generated by all of the construction we've done. So it was nice to have a fresh top coat. It's again really interesting to see how pros do this because I probably would have been up there with a palette knife trying to cover this entire ceiling. Instead, they have these really cool flat boxes that distribute the mud evenly across the entire ceiling and across the walls. And since, of course, you guys know that I'm a tool addict, I had to ask them how much these things cost and how can I get one? 400. 400? Yeah. Wow. This is number 10. Number 10? Number 10. This is number uh, 12. 12. Uh -huh. See. 12, number 12. So, jabón es aquí? Yeah, jabón. ¿Por qué? Dile, tío. Ah. Para que no se haga como es este. Oh, ya. Es, el jabón es poquito. Suave. Es para suave. Que salga Más todo. suave. Sí, para que se hagan todos suave. los poros. Experimento. <laughs> Experimento. <laughs> You'll have to forgive my high school Spanish. It's not very good, but from what I can figure, the soap that they added into the mud was to prevent bubbles from forming, specifically when they're going over the top of the old plaster. It tends to bubble up, and this can cut down on the number of bubbles that you have to repair later. I genuinely wanted to ask them loads of questions about drywalling. I get excited whenever I see somebody who's very good at their craft. And uh, I was just impressed with how this crew handled all the odds and ends in this tiny house. There's a lot of curveballs that have been thrown at them. And I'm just really genuinely appreciative and impressed with how well they've handled all these odds and ends and really taken their time to do it right. So to be honest, there have been several times that I doubted that we could get this list done. This is everything that I needed to do before December, before getting the drywallers in here to mud and everything, and we did it. <laughs> I honestly can't believe it. This space is looking amazing. There's still a little bit more work to do on the drywall side of things. It's winter and dry times are slow because it's very wet here in Seattle, but it's looking amazing and I, I couldn't be happier. There were moments where I thought I, I couldn't save this cove, save the ceiling. I didn't know how to finish off the cove and all those design decisions have been made now and they look great. The arches are maybe my favorite thing in this house now. Hopefully you're enjoying the series. I've got the whole playlist right here if you wanna watch it from start to finish. And big thank you as always to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best. And if you wanna see more of the behind the scenes footage from building out this house, go check out the Patreon. Thanks so much and I'll catch you on the next one.